Good evening. Good evening. You know, I love, I was just telling uh, my brother here, Sandy, I said, there's nothing like it is to be in a room with men singing praise of God. There's something about manly voices singing praises of God that just is encouraging and uplifting. And I, as I did the last time, and we, by the way, I've been here since February last year, and I think it was, was it March, the last time I spoke here too? I think it was the last time, so it's like a, a, a routine now. So I, I, am I on for next March then? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the spaghetti, though. I think everyone liked that. Uh, but what I like to do, like I did last year, and I, I just love it. I, I, a good hallelujah from you men, but a big, burly, manly hallelujah. And I'm going to count one, two, three. Hallelujah! You know, I think you guys can do better than that. Let's try it one more time. <laughs> Got to wake you guys up here. I know the pasta was good and the dessert is still settling. One, two, three. Hallelujah! I love that. When we say hallelujah, it's praise God. And that is what we hear, to praise God as men. And I will like to say that as we're talking about Don, and I will say, one of the guys that as the one year of being here in Maine already, when I went to the men's fellowship and I saw Don, he was one of the guys I really looked forward to seeing at every men's fellowship. And probably the most touching picture I saw online was someone took a picture of Don with his Bible and reading it to his family during those last weeks. It's just a powerful testimony of a man of God ministering to his family. And as we'll see, we'll relate to my message today, which I've titled, Someone is Calling. Someone is calling, and someone's calling for you. And I want to think about calling in the sense of, I, I mean, do you remember when you're a young man, some of you are young men, some of them not as young as we want to, but remember the day your dad handed you the car keys, and he said, son, Let's go for a drive. There's a sense of calling, or maybe when you are on the team and the coach said, I want you on my team. Or when you proposed to your wife and she said yes, and you said, me? You sure? I was ready for no, and she says yes, she, she, she chose you. There's something about calling that that, that encourage us. There's a purpose, a meaning, encouraging that, and there's a need or a desire for calling in our lives. And we are going to look at a particular calling in 1 Kings 19, 19 to 21, just three simple verses. And we're going to look at this calling of Elijah, of Elijah to Elisha, calling Elisha, this, this young man, and we want to look at three things, which is the reason for the call, the challenge of the call, the response of the call, the reason, the challenge, and response. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Kings chapter 19. If you don't have one, there's some in some of the chairs, or you can open up electronic devices. Um, but to, before we get into the passage, you need to remember some of the context of this story. And so, if you remember, earlier in chapter 18 you, is a story of Mount Carmel, of, of, of Elijah taking on the prophets of Baal. And it is a battle of whose God is whose God, whose God is real God, and God send fire from heaven, proving that Yahweh is the one true God. And after that, he runs to confront Jezebel, his nemesis. And she says, you are a dead man, Elijah. And he runs. He runs, and then he gets ministered by angels. And then he goes to the mountain of God. And God, after time and talking to him, talk to him in a still, small voice. And after this event, 
he tells Elijah, go, anoint these two kings, and get Elisha, son of Shephat. And so that is where we're going to pick up the story and understand what this is. And it's about calling. So looking at this, the very first part, verse 19, it says, so he departed from there and found Elijah, son of Shephat. And I just stopped there. I wanted to stop there to consider one thing. Let's remember, why is he going? Why is he getting Elisha? Well, the easy answer is, like I already mentioned in verse 19, it, he was told to go. But it's interesting that, uh, and, and to understand, he goes to verse 14, and he ta- says, why does he go? Yes, it's to go get him. Yes, it's to follow God. It's a command. But there's a specific reason why he told him to get Elisha. And if you look at chapter 19, verse 14, that was just prior, he says this. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and tore down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am alone. I alone am left. And I seek my life to take it away. He feels all alone. Have you guys felt like this? Imagine he has had... He thought a successful ministry, and now he's running for his life. He is at the lowest point in his life. He's run away from his ministry. He's run away from his purpose. He feels like he's the only left, only godly man left. He has no one around him. Have you guys felt like Elijah? Well, you ran away, and you feel, I'm all alone. I'm by myself. What's going on, God? And this is where he's at. And so the reason why I believe God sends Elijah to get Elisha is he needs fellowship. He needs other men around him. And that's why this men's fellowship is all important. Because if you try to do your Christian walk alone, you will feel like Elijah. You will feel, I am all alone, I'm by myself, life is hopeless. The the point of church is we need to encourage each other and edify each other. You need to have brothers who come alongside you when you struggle. And this is one of the reasons he is sent to get Elisha. But there's a second reason why he's sent to get Elijah. And you, if you read through the story, it is to disciple the next generation. Now, there is a lot of gray hair in this audience. Now, I love David Ray Jr. somewhere, and, he, he was, and his son there. That's what we need to see a lot of. And there's some other young men here. But we need, to be a, a, we need to be discipling the next generation. Because if it ends with this generation, it's a her- terrible thing. God says, I am going to send you to get Elisha because, Elijah, you're not going to be around forever. Elijah, you're going to pass away. And I need you to train up the next generation. And in fact, train up Elijah will have a greater impact in the world than Mount Carmel. We love Mount Carmel. It's this epic scene. It's an amazing scene. But what happened? Did Israel change? Did they repent? Did Jezreel run away? No. But he points Elisha. Elijah would have a difference. And not only that, but if you go to 2 Kings chapter 2, you find out that he's trained up 150 other prophets. The most important thing we can do is train up the next generation. The next generation is what's important. And a lot of times we get focused on our generation and we think, well, I guess it's going to go down with me. 
But God says, no, train up the next generation. And this is a job of every pastor, and this is a hope of every pastor, that they'll train up the next generation. And there's nothing more beautiful than you have David Ray Sr., David Ray Jr., and the grandson all in the same room. Isn't that the hope that we all have? And somehow, I, I think we've missed out on this. You know, Timothy says, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, the things which you have heard from me and in presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men who be able to teach others. It, isn't it interesting? He says, teach Timothy. I've trained you. Now, Timothy, I want you to train other men and I want those men to train the next men. In other words, it is always a training up. And we are to call, just like Elijah is called to train up Josh, uh, uh, Elisha, we are called to train up the next generation who will train up the next one to train up the next one. That is the call we have. And so now we get a little bit of idea of what's going on, what, why is he being sent out. But I'm going to read a little bit more in verse 19. So he part from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, and while he was playing with the twelfth pair of oxen before him, he was with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Now it's important to note, it would take a long time to get from the mountain of God all the way down here, all the way to Abomaliha. That would be a long journey. And I've often thought, as I was considering this, what do you think he did there in that time? I mean, he's walking, or if, if he does have a camel, he is on this route, a very long route. And I believe, though I can't prove it, he was probably praying. He's probably praying for Elisha. In fact, he's, he, we, we get an idea he probably knows who Elisha is, because when he gets to the town, he doesn't need anyone to point him out. He's like, there he is. I think he knew who he was, but more important, I think he was praying for him. Because the, what the calling he was about to call on would be an epic. Now, I can't prove where Elisha did this, but I know Jesus did. If you go to Luke 6, 12 to 13, it says, now it happened that at the time he went off to the mountain to pray, he was spending the whole night in prayer with God, and when, he, when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, who he also named apostles. And this is a reminder, as you call up the first next generation, are we praying for them? Do, is there a young man or a, 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 a person, are you praying for them? And say, God, like there's a young man at our church right now. He's going to Bible college. His name is Richard. Uh, and I pray for him. And we, we have talks and we talk about, but I pray for him because he's on this journey to go to Bible college, to become a pastor and hopefully youth pastor. But I pray for him. Are we praying for the next generation that goes before us? I think one of the problems when we get fixated on end time stuff if we don't, we stop looking towards the future. We so much focus like, well, it looks like Russia is going into Ukraine, might be World War III, looks like everything's over, guess what happens? Discipleship stops. We start, we just so focus on end times, and I think it's unhealthy. Our goal, where it's the end times or not, is to train up the next generation and praying for the next generation. And as Jesus prayed for the future disciples, that he would choose with the Father. We should be praying for the future disciples too. Now it's also important, I think, to note that you notice he doesn't get the kings. In fact, if you go back to the earlier part, he's, God says, go get the kings, anoint them, and then get Elisha. The funny thing is, he actually goes and gets Elisha, and the kings don't come up until later on in 2 Kings. Why does he get him first? Because ministry 
is life on life. And he says, if I'm going to do this ministry, and if Elisha is going to come after me, then I need to get him first. I need to get to him. I need to pray with him. I need him to join me in ministry now. Because ministry is not just memorizing the Bible or going to church on Sunday or just prayer. It's life on life. Discipleship is them walking where you walk and going through the trials and tribulations of life and struggling together and doing ministry together is far more than just head knowledge, is life. Now, a great example is I had a pastor friend of mine in Hayward, California, that when sometimes he would disciple someone, he would quite literally have them live with him for a whole month. So they could see how he lived his life. So they could see how he loved his wife. So he could see how he raised his children. And that is what discipleship is. In fact, if you go to uh, what a disciple is in Jesus' day, quite literally, they would follow the rabbi. And whatever the rabbi did, the disciples did. And so this is why he went to get to Elijah first, because he needed to train him up. He's going to replace Elijah, and so he will now spend the next 10 years pouring into this young man to prepare him to train him up. And we need to do that too with the future generation. We need to be training up. We need to spend time with them. It is not something that just happens on Sunday morning. It is something that should be done throughout years of life. Getting to know them, spending time with them, just hanging out, having meals together. This is what it means to disciple. The other thing I want to point out as we looked at this passage is there's this number 12. Why 12? Anyone? Why is it 12? Why, why was it significant that there's 12 pair of oxen? How many, how many tribes are there? 12 tribes. Yeah, there would be later 12 apostles, but in this case, we're going to focus on the 12 tribes. God, with these oxen, shows Elijah, wow, he's already leading 12. And so with the symbolism, he sees how God's already working with his life. But not only is he 12, but it's 12 pair of oxen, and he's leading them, which means there's 12 teams, and he would be on the very back team. And the other ones would be up ahead, and he was telling our teams, no, a little left, a little right. And he would be guiding. He already shows not only symbolically leading 12, but he already showing the leadership skills to lead Israel. And this is a powerful image. And we need to be looking at the future generations who we're choosing. What are their characters? What are their abilities? How do you see God working in their lives? Because as Elijah sees Elisha, he can see it. So I meant to show you that earlier. What is the reason for the call now? Well, I, I, that was supposed to be something else. What is the reason for the call? The reason for a call is he's calling first the next generation, and now we're talking about the challenge of the call. And it starts in verse 19, the, second, the last part, where it says, And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Now, this is one of these verses that we quickly run over. and We never have taken the time to think about it. But the, this is a powerful image. And first of all, I want you to first understand, imagine you're at work, you're doing your job, and someone just randomly throw coats on you, it would be surprising. But it would be more surprising if the coat that the person put on you was a prophet of God. And you'd be like, what is going on? Well, not only that, but a mantle, the cloak, is to be a symbol, is similar to like a king's crown or robe 
or officer's uniform. It represents who Elijah was. And so when he takes off his coat and he puts on the young man, he's trying to say, you're next. You're next. And to some degree, are we doing that with the next generation? Are we taking off our coat and say, you're going to be the leader of this church someday, and I'm going to pour into you? We need to be calling forth the next generation as we see him doing here, because he is a future. Now it goes on to say in verse 20, and it says this, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother and I will follow you. And Elijah says to him, go back again for what have I done with you? It's one of the more odd phrases. You know, every once in a while you read a Bible and you're like, why did Elijah say that? Now there's, there's, there's one idea that potentially what he's trying to say, I'm not calling you, God's calling you. I have nothing to do with it. That's one idea. But what I'm thinking what Elijah doing is he's challenging them. He says, I'm calling you into ministry. God is calling you to ministry. Are you going to take it or are you going to just go back home? If you don't go back home, go, go ahead and do it. But if you don't come, follow me now. And it shouldn't surprise us because Jesus says something very similar when a young man came to him and said, I want to be your disciple. And Jesus says, and then after the young man said, well, let me say goodbye to my parents, Jesus says something similar. No one after putting his hand to a plow, looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. God is calling young men forward. God is calling us that when we get called, where our lives could never be the same again, with that old life is gone, is dead. And the challenge is we need to move forward and move forward with our lives, move forward in discipleship. And there's a challenge there. Now, the question is, why does there seem to be some apprehension in Elijah's life? And there could be three potential answers. He could feel unworthy. I mean, there's imagine. He's being called to fill Elijah's shoe. Who can fill Elijah's shoes? Who could fill Billy Graham's shoes? Who can fill this, this person's shoes? And there's probably a sense, of, I don't know if I can do this. Another possibility is he's, he's worried about being persecuted. What was the last thing that happened to Elijah? Jezebel says, you are a dead man. Elijah might be saying, I don't want to give up in that. That's not pretty. And I've seen what has happened to other prophets. They've killed other prophets. I don't know if I want to step into that. But the third one, as you see, is the wealth and comfort of home. Now, this is something we miss. But in the passage, he had 12 pair of oxen. That's important, because if you're a poor person, you wouldn't have oxen. You have a donkey. And if you are middle class, you might have cattle. But he doesn't have a donkey or cattle. His oxen. And only the wealthy had oxen. And no one does have one oxen. He has 12 pairs which means he's coming from a very, very wealthy family. And if he takes this up and becomes the next prophet, he's walking away from all of that. He's walking away from all of that. He will not have that comfort and luxury of home. Imagine if he's that wealthy, he probably even had servants. Clothing, food, a luxury lifestyle. But when God calls on you, you have to be willing to leave that all behind. 
And that, I believe, is a reason for his apprehension. I think it's a reason why a lot of us have apprehension about following after God. There are stuff in this world that we like too much. We don't want to give it up. And so we just, no, I don't want to do that. And not only that, but sometimes you'll say, well, I'll follow you, God, to this point. This is where I'm safe. But God doesn't call you to where you're safe. God calls you to follow him faithfully and risk for his kingdom and for his glory. Then we go into the next part of verse, oh, there's our oxen. Now the response of the call. He has to respond. What will Elisha do? And so Elijah then says, so he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them, boiled their flesh and implements on the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And he rose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. What does he do? He's willing to sacrifice it all. And it mentions that all three. First, he's willing to sacrifice his parents. He says, I'm mom, dad, I'm leaving to go follow God. And in fact, Jesus says, you know, no man is fit for a king that, that is not willing to give up family, friends, everything for the kingdom of God. You have to be willing to sacrifice those relationships to follow him. To some degree, as you guys know, I left California. All my friends and family, everyone ever right now was in California. It would have been very happy and comfortable to stay in California. But when God said, go to Maine, to go to a place that you don't know, go to a people you don't know, yes, I'll go. And that's what he's willing to do. And that's what God is saying, asking us to do. What are you willing to sacrifice? Not only that, but then he, he talks about burning his plow, his oxen, He's sacrificing his old lifestyle. He's burning his boats. Like Cortez did when he came to Americas. He's saying, my old life is dead. There's only my new future. My old job doesn't matter. I'm going this way. Third, he has this meal offering. Now, this is important because in the Old Testament, meals, and these type of meals, had a covenant kind of sense to it. You're saying, you're declaring to the people, I'm no longer going to be this rich man's son. I'm going to follow Elijah. I'm going to be his disciple. And everyone in town knows. So if he ever goes back to town, they're all going to know he quit. And so... He is making, he's sacrificing all, everything he knew, everything he has to fall after God. And that's a call of all when we give our lives to Christ. We must be willing to sacrifice it all. And so we have Elijah. This is one of my favorite statues. Elijah and Elisha. You have Two men, a, the current leader and the future leader, the discipler and the disciple. And in this room, there are disciplers and disciples. And the God is calling you tonight, if some of you, you should have been a disciple a long time ago. And you should have been training up the next generation. God right now is asking you, will you train up the next generation? So the next generation is better than the one you had before you. He's asking you to train them up. Because if we don't train up the next generation, they won't. God's asking for you disciples. There's other people you, who are disciples, and you need to find a discipler. And you don't know a discipler, talk to your pastor, he'll can either disciple you or find a mentor. But 
This is how church growth happens. Mentorship, discipling, disciplers. And only through that will we see revival in this country. Only by that will we see our country change. Politics will not solve the problems of this world. Only the gospel going out and spreading the gospel and making disciples and then making disciples will this world be changed. It is only through the work of God can it change, and he uses ordinary people like us. So, I will ask, if you feel like God is calling you to be a disciple today, please stand. If God's asking you today to be a disciple, please stand. Now, there's a couple of people who aren't standing, and that's okay. If you feel like you need to be a disciple, that's all right. Find a disciple. But you men, I want to pray over you guys. Because God... And I want you, maybe tonight, go home, write down your diet in your Bible. I'm called to be a discipler. I'm called to call up the next generation. Because that's the only way the world's going to change. And I'm going to pray for you guys real quick. And I'll let you guys go. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I want to pray for these men who are standing up right now who recognize you have a calling on their lives to train up the next generation, to be Elijah's to Elisha's, to be a Paul to a Timothy or Titus or Barnabas to a Mark or Peter to a Mark. God, you are calling these men. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them. I pray you would reveal to them who you want them to disciple. Right now, Lord, one of them may be thinking, I know who I need to be disciple. And if they don't, Lord, I pray you reveal to them who you want them to disciple. Who is that young man that they can pour into to be a disciple? Lord, encourage them, strengthen them, make them bold with their faith. I pray that this will be a start of a revival to create disciple makers. And that the church in Maine will never be the same again. And that these men would boldly go and make it future disciples. And maybe next year, if we have it here in New Hope, we will see this room filled with new disciples. That is my prayer. And you will use, Lord, I pray you use these men to do it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.